So hi, hey, hello everyone. I am here to do a very, very overdue wrap up. I have eight books to talk about, so let's get going. The first one I'm going to be talking about is a Goosebumps book called A Night in Terror Tower. So this is a story about two children named Eddie and Sue who are on vacation in England, London, uh, spe specifically, while their parents attend um, this meeting or this conference, whatever you want to call it. So Eddie and Sue are on a tour and one of the places they stop is a place called Terror Tower, a place where hundreds of years ago people were taken basically to be tortured. Yes, I know, this is a Goosebumps book, which means it is a middle grade book. So they go through Terror Tower. One of the stories that is told is the story of a prince and a princess who were imprisoned in, in the tower and who one day disappeared. So as they are going along, Eddie and Sue happen to be separated from their tour. And then they start to be pursued by a man in black. They go to... They get a taxi, they find out basically that their money is fake. Of course, they go into the hotel to tell their parents, and then they find out that the room they are, are supposed to be in is marked as vacant. So, of course, the person at the desk asks them what their last name is to so look it up. And Eddie and Sue cannot remember what their last name is. They cannot, they cannot remember what their parents look like, if they live in a house. They cannot remember anything. So, we have the story about two children in a foreign country who are being pursued by this mysterious man. And all they can remember is that day. So... This one, I feel, is one of the more creepier Goosebumps books. It, it's got that eerie feeling to it because you have to imagine that it would be terrifying as a child to be, you know, in, in, in a foreign country being chased by this person and you don't even remember what your damn last name is. The next one is Attack of the Mutant. So this one is a little bit more fun. I'd say if you're into comics and adventure, you'd like this one. Um, comics, manga, graphic novels were something I'm slowly getting into. So I think if you like that kind of stuff, fun adventure and kind of poking fun at some stuff, you'll enjoy this one. This villain basically is about a boy named Skipper, uh, whose real name is Bradley. We don't see that in the episode, but we see it in the book. Skipper, a.k.a. Bradley, whatever you want to call him, is obsessed with a character called the Masked Mutant. He collects comics, but the mutant is like his number one thing. One day, on the way to the dentist, he sees what he thinks is the mutant's headquarters, but this can't be because the mutant is a comic book character, so how out in the middle of like a city is this building? On the bus, he meets a girl named Libby who thinks he's kind of strange. They sort of kind of develop a friendship. You see a little bit more of Libby in the book, even though it's a very short book because, again, it's a middle grade book. But his one friend says that it's probably like a promotion thing. People from the comic who wrote it maybe made this building or they saw it and they put it into their book. He's trying to like rationalize things. But Skipper is seeing messages in his new comics. He's seeing uh, panels with him in the comics. And the story just kind of takes off from there. Like I said, it's very fun. I was kind of reluctant to pick it up at first because my kid watched the episode over and over and over again. But I'm glad I read it because it was a fun read. Next up is me and Earl and the Dying Girl. So, I thought in some ways that 
maybe the author tried a little too hard to be edgy. I like the fact that the two characters in here were not romantic. There was no romance. I like the fact that Earl called out Greg on kind of his selfishness and everything. And I wish more of that would have happened. I wish we would have had more of those emotional moments. Like, it doesn't have to be romantic and overly sappy to convey the emotions of two teens who know another teen who has leukemia, okay? I think it was funny and well-written. I just think that some of the deeper moments could have been a little bit more. And we didn't have to lose the humor for that. But anyways, me and Earl and the Dying Girl are about two characters, Earl and Greg. Greg is the me in the book. And they make home movies together, but Earl is kind of a person... Earl, sorry. Greg is the type of person who just kind of wants to slide by in life. He wants to be friends with everyone. He wants to impress everyone. He cares about what they think. Whereas Earl does not give to craps. Earl has no filter. He's vulgar at times. But we also get to see that in a lot of way he in a lot of ways he cares. He cares about Rachel, who is a girl that Greg used to kind of sort of date when they were like younger. And because Rachel now has leukemia, his Greg's mother is making him visit and spend time with Rachel, which she really doesn't want to do. But then they kind of start like rebuilding this friendship in a sort of kind of way. The book is funny. It does have its moments. I thought there could have been more to it, but I think it's worth picking up again and I'm glad I read it. The next one is by a fantastic YouTuber, a fantastic booktuber who was awesome enough to buy my book and everything and give an excellent review. But unlike me, who has only gotten little short stories out there, he was able to actually put out an actual book book, a novel. And that is The Vulnerable Gods by Todd Wittenmeyer. Or oh, Todd the Librarian. So The Vulnerable Gods is a sci-fi book, I guess you would say. And it is about a town that is kind of... Um, shook up, I guess you would say, by this mysterious murder and these mysterious murders that are happening. Because this homeless man gets killed. God, Todd, I hope I'm not like butchering your freaking book here because I'm so bad at reviewing things even though I love doing it. Anyways, beginning, we have a homeless man that is killed and the people can only describe this person who is the killer as like tattered clothes, like animal skins. He has ice in his hair, despite the fact that it is spring. And then, so you have like the police chief and I believe his nephew. Actually, I think his nephew is the one that got hurt or something like that. But you have like, um, yeah, you have the whole like police force and them trying to figure this thing out, this crazy murder out and then on the other side of the story you have a woman named Helen who is a scientist she has a husband and a stepson and I love the fact that she treats her stepson like her own son and they have that bond I love the fact that you have a husband who acts like a husband acts manly and everything, but it's not overbearing. It's not a stereotype. Um, they trust each other. They love each other. They have good communication. They have their worries. They are human, but again, they have confidence in their relationship. I love that. I love the confidence. I love the fact that blood doesn't always make family. And so Helen is the partner of Virgil. Virgil is uh, a slap-worthy character, and, and I like that too. I feel that if you feel a certain way about a character, 
as, you know, somebody who's not real and they really make you feel like you want to slap them or hug them or love them, whatever, something very passionate, whether it's good or bad, I feel that it's very good writing. Like, you honestly feel something about this character. So, Virgil has made this discovery. He has this scientific um, great thing going on, and Helen is trying to pursue him to go public. Both Helen and her husband, I'm drawing a blank on her on his name now. I think it was Greg. Greg was her husband's name. And I believe her son, her stepson's name was Brian. But um, both Helen and Greg know that Virgil has a thing for uh, Helen. But she's just trying to bite her tongue, get through things so they can go public with this thing. Um... Some more of the book's a little bit hard to talk about without giving things away. Just know that this is a fantastic book. Like, forget the fact that it's indie written. And I probably didn't notice typos or whatever because I read it on um, Nook. And Nook tends to kind of be a little bit weird sometimes with their um, ebook. So, but either way, it's much, much better edited than my book was. And it, it's a story that keeps you engaged. I was not expecting the ending. I like the fact that, you know, we got to see different characters. And yeah, if you pick up a book by an indie author, make sure it's that one. Now, going from The Vulnerable Gods, I have to talk about Midworld, which is probably Todd's favorite book. Um, one thing I love about BookTube is the fact that I have discovered books that I probably never would have picked up. Either I just didn't know much about them, I didn't think too much about them, or, you know, yeah, I just didn't hear about them. And this goes for both adult and young adult. So, the thing about Midworld is the description. You really feel... When you're reading this, that you, you can really imagine this planet that they're on. You can imagine yourself in this world. This world of unique plant life. Of a n different sort of group of humans. Dangerous animals with furs and claws and um, unique plant life. I, I I love ideas like that. I love ideas of how things could be. So, Midworld. Midworld basically is about this unnamed planet. And our main character is a character named Born, who lives in, I guess you would say, like this tribe of people. Just stop it. They have... Certain physical differences from us, like they have longer feet, they are much shorter, and they live in like in the middle of the planet. Um, at least I, I hope that's what I read and what I comprehended. Because basically, they live in what they call the home tree. And the sky and the surface are what they call the upper and lower hells. They are filled with these... Dangerous, very creepy sounding creatures. And one day, Born comes across a thing called a skimmer and he meets these people who he calls giants. The giants basically are, I guess you would call scientists, and Born is helping them get through his world back to like their station. And because Born's people are much more in tune with their planet, they find him to be, his people to be, to have regressed. They think of them as primitive. Everything Born does, they see as, they see in a scientific way. 
such as for the home tree to recognize them as a person that lives there. They like spin into this plant and they know about certain other things. They feel it is like a spiritual connection, his, him and his people, whereas the two giants, they are trying to see this in a biological and like science-y kind of way. If I could describe it how I felt Born's people are, is that they are very um, animistic. And for people who really don't know what that means, like, I know there's different levels of animism and everything, and in my spiritual practice, I feel that it, it, it's incorporated in mind to some degree. Some people are much more deep into it, but basically, animism is the belief that everything has a soul. Now, there are some people who believe that Every inanimate object has it, and there are some people who believe just like natural things like rocks, dirt, and, and things have like a spirit. And that's kind of like the vibe that the people of Midworld gave off. Like, they believe in like this animistic view of life. Whereas, of course, the scientific people are just interested in what they want and getting it home, and they kind of get annoyed at Bourne's questions about their world or his answers about his own, because he answers it more in a spiritual kind of way, that this is just the way of the home tree, this is the way of life, um, this and that happens, and, you know, they're, they're not satisfied with that. But the thing is that this has great description. Like I said, the characters, um, you, you know, you really see where each one of them are coming from, that, you know, being on a different world and a different culture, how that can clash about learning and, and knowledge and ignorance and, uh, y you know, just the idea of being on a totally different world that, you know, has similarities to our own, but are also much different. I would definitely say this is worth picking up. I, I totally see why he loves this book because it, it's just fantastic if you want a book where you're just pulled into the world and all that good stuff definitely read Mid world next up we have a reread of catching fire which is the second book in the hunger games trilogy i read this for uh crescent moon reads uh hunger along I decided not to read the other two because the last time I had skipped Catching Fire. So I used to say that I liked the books in order, but now I think the second book might be my least favorite. I think it's because the whole... I don't even want to call it a love triangle because I think people kind of diss the series because of that. But the questions of certain things come up more in this book and I feel that it wasn't really in the first book. And she kind of leaves it in the, in the third one. Also, we have very, we have similarities to the first one. But I like the fact that we got to know other tributes and everything as compared to the first one where it was mainly Katniss and Peeta. So, Catching Fire. Katniss has managed to get out of the games. And the president is not happy about that because... He shows up to her house to tell her that people in the districts really do not believe that it was an act of love, but an act of defiance to the capital. And she must convince him of things. She also learns from two other people who have escaped from District 8 that rebellions are starting in some of the districts. The first rebellion is, of course, what led to the creation Love you, Nady. Which led to the creation of the games in the first place. So, once you become a victor, you must go on what is called the victory tour. So not only do you have to win the games by outliving other children, you must visit their districts and face the families of the people you killed or, you know, outlived. And of course, if you've read the first book, you know District 11 plays a big part in... Um, 
what happens with Katniss and everything. So that's very emotional for her. And to make matters worse, when a man from the district gives her her District 12 salute, he is taken by peacekeepers and basically shot and killed in the middle of the crowd. And that's where things start to take an uh, even more darker turn for poor Katniss here. Because she has the president, you know, watching her every move. She just watched this man get killed. She's hearing about rebellions. And then comes the quarter quell. So the quarter quell is the games that happen every 25 years. So uh, the first quarter quell was the 25th, and then um, Hamish is games, who is her mentor. His game was for the 50th, and now they are in the 75th games. So the quarter quell requires a special games. In the first one, uh, people actually had to vote on the children that were going to go in the games because normally they randomly pick from this bowl. And so the first one, the special thing, was to vote on the children that went. In the 50th, which was her uh, mentor's games, they had to um, double the amount. So he won out of 47 children as compared to... 24 or 23 and now for this one the special games is that they are pulling from the existing pool of victors which is pretty bad considering the fact that once you win the games you're supposed to be left alone but What's even worse is that Katniss is District 12's only female victor, which means she's going back to the arena. So, this one, uh, like I said, the, it has somewhat of the same premise because we are going back to the games, Katniss is going back to the arena, but now we see past victors. Um... We see the good and the bad. We see um, the elderly mags who volunteers for Annie, despite the fact that, you know, as Katniss says, she knows she can't win because of her age, and she did it for Annie. We get to see Fennec, who is one of my absolute favorite characters in the series. Um, there's, you know, we learn there's a lot more to him and everything. I love that these characters have layers. You know, there's just this whole thing about Katniss trying to keep up this persona of this victor. Like, she has to kind of come up with this talent she has. And we see a little bit more humor in her. There's this whole thing between Peta and Gail and their families. We were reminded that she is a young woman who is who did this to protect her sister. And now... She has to continue protecting. She has to continue with the show because she has to keep the keep up this keep up this show and everything to protect not only her family but the people of her district. Now she is faced with this tour, with being reminded of these deaths. Um, there's this rebellion happening, and now she's going back to the games. And we just dive deeper into the cruelty of this world. Um, they get like a new head peacekeeper and everything. And when she gets um, back to the capital to prepare for the new game, she learns that um, one of the peacekeepers that she actually liked um, has become an AVOX. And what an AVOX is, is a person who is basically punished by having their tongue cut out and being made to be a servant. And I think it was a great continuation of the story. Like I said, I love the fact that we got to see some more characters. I just didn't love it as much as I did the first time I read it. I know it might be an unpopular opinion, but I honestly kind of think Mockingjay was a little bit better. But again, I like the fact that they didn't tone down the fact that they live 
in this harsh dystopian society. I also love the mixture, just like the first book, of old and new. Um, there's a character in the book when they're in the games that get hurt, that gets hurt by the um, the force field, I guess you would call it. And one of the other tributes um, goes to try and save them, and she talks about how he tries to like pound on his chest and everything and give him air and how she has seen her mother do this. And I'm reading this and I'm thinking that 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 CBR Katniss, but they they don't know about that kind of thing because in District Twelve they are so poor they heal each other by plants and ice and, and all that other stuff. So it, that that was kind of interesting again that you know that continuation of that thought in that world is still there. The next book I want to be talking about is 101 Dalmatians. Now, like most of you, I have seen the Disney adaptation several times. This book, it was a little bit more sad in some ways. And it also had that adventure. I feel this is kind of a story that tried to be either fun or tragic or both, but didn't quite make it fully for either one of them. It's a good read. It's entertaining. I think if you liked the um, the movie, the cartoon, you liked this one. So if you're not familiar with the premise of 101 Dalmatians, man and his dog meets woman and her dog, all fall in love. And this one, they have like two maids, whereas in the movie they had one. And there's this woman named Kurala who likes furs. And she wants the dogs. So then she goes and she kidnaps these puppies. And the story takes on from there. So what's different from the book versus the story versus the movie is that um, the mother of Pongo's puppies and Perdita are actually two different dogs. Um, Pongo's wife is called Mrs. and when they get married she is Mrs. Pongo. Perdita is brought in as kind of like a wet nurse kind of thing. She is another Dalmatian whose puppies have been like taken from her. And in this one, Koala is actually married. Um, so there's slight differences. The story is basically the same, but we get a little bit of a different story, obviously with Perdita and the loss of her puppies and such, and you know, some other characters. Um, but pretty much most of it was the same. I think it's a fairly good children's book. Perhaps one day I should read it again. I just I don't know. It was it was pretty good. I wouldn't say it was one of my absolute favorites, but it was entertaining. Maybe I just kind of wish that there was a little bit more emotional stuff in there, but you know, all is good. Then the last book I'm going to be talking about is Will Grayson, Will Grayson by John Green and David Levithan. So what I liked about this book is it is about two characters named Will Grayson and Will Grayson who happen to meet at a shop that basically sells pornography. And so John Green wrote the first Will Grayson and David Levithan wrote the second one, and they each have these, you know, separate lives, and then, of course, they come to meet. So the first Will Grayson is friends with a person named Tiny Cooper, who he describes as the biggest gay person or the gayest person who is big. Tiny is full of life, and him and Will are part of the Gay Straight Alliance. 
So this Will Grayson ends up at the shop after he cannot get into a concert because his fake ID has the wrong uh, date on it. So he is considered on his ID to be 20 and not 21. And the other Will Grayson just wants to make it through life. He He's... Um, he's gay, but he's not quite out of the closet yet. And then he goes to meet a person who he thinks is sort of his online boyfriend. And when it doesn't turn out to be quite what he thinks it is, that is where him and the other Will Grayson meet. So, the story is uh, fantastic. They meet up because of Tiny Cooper. And I just love the fact that the story 